thank you. That's why I needed a couple minutes. I was like, I had it on the uh, saved because actually there's a guy I'm talking to. Uh, really surprising. He does uh, lax jitsu, but I got down there and he started giving me like a whole history lesson of the local indigenous culture from back when like Henry Hudson came up and originally traded with the Mohawks and four C Algonquins out. And then we talked about the uh, two Wamp belt treaty. So he was actually, he spent some time up there. He was fairly knowledgeable. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So anyways, thank you very much for uh, taking the time. Absolutely. Um, tomorrow uh, is the day that the, well, the 227th anniversary, I believe, of the uh, treaty, the uh, Canandaigua Treaty, sorry. Yeah, no worries. It's all good. It's a big day. Yeah, it's uh, a lot going on. It's, it's funny that I, uh, one of the biggest things I find is I grew up not very far from uh, Canandaigua and up where you guys are and i did not learn any of this history and i was only two hours away yeah that's crazy yeah and there's two treaties in fort stanwix in rome you know and then those aren't always talked about either you know so interesting the uh the variations of american history that are omitted and what are left in even regionally yeah um now i found it very uh um i don't know what the right word to be uh to use is but so when you, i actually learned what the canandaigua treaty is is that you know essentially the original two wampum belt was with the dutch settlers and then the canandaigua treaty was signed uh with a delegation from george washington in effect uh establishing the original 13 colonies with the u.s um government mm -hmm. and setting up the two separate nations which you would think would have been the last treaty needed but that obviously wasn't the case as you were just talking about there's two other uh treaties well there's a number of treaties yeah that happens um you know starting in the 1600s with the Turo wampum and the dutch you know and then you know as it goes through you have other conversations and treaties created um I think the conversation that kind of happens with what, what evolved with the treaties in history, I think from the indigenous perspective, right, is that there was, we had a house, um, you know, some might call it a mansion, right? Some big resources, a lot of space. And so there was a lot of rooms. And so the way you can look at it is we were allowing people to come in and occupy a room right? Some, some space where they could call their own, right? But still understanding whose house they were in. Um, I think what happened is as that, as that transpired, you know, the people that were in the room said, hey, there's a party over here, come on over, right? And so everyone goes over to party in the room, but then, you know, like any party you throw, who's going to stay in the room, right? They're going to go out in the hallway. They're going to go use the bathroom. They're going to use the kitchen. You can see what I'm saying. And so that was encroachment into those other spaces that we were occupying. And, and which is what necessitates continuous treaties because there's individual people that are being invited to join the party that are not acknowledging, aware of, or understanding the agreed upon space by which that space was agreed to be utilized right so you have new people coming in no knowledge of of these agreements and encroaching into this space right and so our people who had always been there who had communicated these relationships and these agreements to all of our citizens are saying well why aren't these people communicating this to their own right um, and so you have these continued need for more and more treaty agreements so that's why we have uh agreements with the the dutch the english the french and the united states right uh and and so i think that's what kind of gets lost um it, interestingly enough you know you know all around the american revolution and the two different uh treaties at fort stanwix and then the Canandaigua treaty 
kind of establish the boundaries <clears throat> by which the United States and the Haudenosaunee is, is, is bound. And it also acknowledges the sovereign status, right? And to this day, uh, our nations receive payment per the Canadagua Treaty, right? <clears throat> for that agreement. But government officials will not, they'll come to speak to our leaders, but they'll say, we're not here to talk about sovereign status and the Canadagua Treaty. We're not here to talk about the Tuaro Wampum Treaty, right? And they'll list out the treaties they're not willing to talk about, but then they'll say, but well, we're not willing to talk about everything else that you're willing to talk about. And we'll say, no, 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 no. This happens. This has happened numerous times. And our leaders will say, no, you are here to communicate about and acknowledge our sovereign status. Oh, no, not going to do that. So the meeting ends. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and it's pretty. It's crazy that like, so the Erie Canal, of course, I never learned any of, you know, mm -hmm. this, the other side of the Erie Canal until after speaking to you when I started uh, researching some stuff that the Erie Canal runs straight through your sovereign nation. And mm -hmm. they were just like, hey, by the way, we're doing this. Sorry mm -hmm. about your luck. Yeah. 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 And well, and, and, well <clears throat> not only the Erie Canal, but then later, uh, all the highways. Yeah, 81. 81, the throughway goes through all these different Haudenosaunee communities. And the reason they go through those communities or by those communities is they're like, oh, well, if we go this way through this community, we can get this span of two miles or stretch of three miles or whatever it was that they were looking at. And we'll just take it over. And so you have more indigenous land encroached upon with highway because the assumption is as well we own it anyway so we don't have to pay anybody for it except that there are these treaty agreements that are in existence right new york state exists predominantly based and and much of new york state exists based on a variety of treaties that were made with the haudenosaunee that were after the canadagua treaty and that were never ratified by the U.S. Congress, and they're made state state to the nation, right? Which inherently renders a treaty null and void, right? right. Uh, so if we really think about the land and who owns the land, right? We can go back to the Canandaigua Treaty and say, well, this is when uh, George Washington asked uh, General Pickering to represent the United States to request this treaty with the Haudenosaunee to which we sent uh, 1,600 representatives, right? Uh, to, to commemorate this and agree upon this treaty. The United States presented a wampum that they made uh, and presented to, to communicate to us in our, our, our way of understanding the world, right? To commemorate this agreement between these two sovereign nations and to acknowledge sovereign status. And then to have New York State and all these other states turn right around and just start unilaterally just grabbing land. Yeah, I uh, I was able to find what I think is a map of the territory from the uh, Canandaigua Treaty, yeah. which looks eerily similar to what I was educated as to the Louisiana Purchase. Yeah. It kind of really looks like that, Lance. Like, I could not yeah. believe it when I looked it up today after talking to somebody else. Yeah. And uh, so I was doing the research, and all of a sudden I was like, it kind of looks like the Louisiana Purchase. So how did we purchase it from the French when we we literally had a contract, which is supposed to be everything we follow. That's what we, you See. know, if it's written in law, that's why we have so many See. rules. And it's silly how many laws we have when really it could be way simpler. But yeah and then to just violate the initial ones and then never acknowledge it at all yeah blows my mind yeah well it's uh it's in it's in the constitution that the law of the land is treaty law right treaty agreement <clears throat> unless that treaty is made with indigenous people <laughs> yeah the uh the, the 13 arrows when you told explained to me the 13 arrows and all of that too and then i started looking into it more and more and you actually see in some of these treaties and some of the uh the letters from george washington and whatnot that they literally like reference everything about you guys and like your people for it and then there's no credit 
given to it at all. And like the whole setup where like you had the two biggest nations on one side and the other two smaller nations. And then you guys, the, uh, I believe you're Onondaga, right? I'm Onondaga. Yeah. Yeah. So, and like your nation was the, uh, like the chairperson. Central just, yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much, uh, history there. And I didn't learn any of that. And like I said, it just blew my mind that I was two hours away. And didn't, I didn't realize I lived next to what is essentially is, should be a sovereign country yeah. by all rights until I started playing lacrosse in Utica. And Paul was like, no, if you really want to see what lacrosse is, you need to go up to the reservation. And we played against that, uh, one of the Tri-City, we scrimmaged a Tri-City team. Mm -hmm. And oh my goodness, was that an eye-opening experience for me. Yeah. Like I, it was, I had seen Dave, basically Dave Sikosi. And then there was a couple other kids on our team that could play, but like Dave was my eye opening experience in college. Like, Oh wow. That's like, you know, a level with his stick that like, I cannot catch up to in two years or three mm -hmm. years. I don't care how much work I put into in two or three years. I'm not going to catch up to a lifetime of, uh, of having it. And the whole culture is just, yeah, it's really, uh, I enjoy reading about it and some of it's terrible to read about. I try to, uh, do my small part with it, but yeah, it's, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time on this and educating me on it. And I hope we teach anybody about this. This would be great. My kids will at least know, but yeah, my, you know, my, I grew up, you know, my, my father was, a, was one of the chiefs and, and he traveled and, and spoke a lot and would take me, uh, with him when he spoke and, the irony was, you know, because ed the education and it hasn't drastically changed, um, was based on a historical perspective, right? So he had to go in as a contemporary person and take his his young son, who was these some of sometimes these kids peer, right? So I'm there, you know, as fourth grader, fifth grader, looking at other fourth and fifth graders, and he'd say, "Look." This is my son. He's Onondaga Eel Clan, and he has the same clothes on as you. He can speak your language. He knows about your history. He knows who you are. He knows where you come from. But do you know where he comes from? You know, and, and last night, um, we just released a podcast through Syracuse University Special Collections called The Land You're On. And it's a, it's a truth-telling podcast for Syracuse University, Native American, Indigenous alums, but um, some of them, you know, telling some pretty real stuff about their experiences. And what's really interesting about what's going on in that, in that, um, in that podcast is that um, people are being introduced to kind of like what you're saying, this new way of thinking or these new concepts to them that they've never heard before. And and why why did I grow up next to this this space, this, these people, and I know nothing, right? And so the 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 other, one of the other producers was doing his presentation last night, and he said that he said, you know, I grew up on the west side, I grew up, you know, a mile from from the border of the nation, and he says I could have a conversation with another person who is indigenous, and they would know almost everything about me and my history and my people and my country and my worldview and our politics and all these other things about how we see the world and i would know nothing about them he goes i thought i knew i thought i knew and i realize now that i knew nothing and he goes and i'm still learning every day today every time i reach out to neil you know because i'm a co-producer on the on the podcast right he goes, every time I reach out to Neil for a guidance, uh, he goes, I learned something new, a new nuance, a new thing. He goes, and I, I've been engaged with all of this stuff and all of these information, all these podcasts. There's 12 episodes, 25 minute uh, episodes each. He goes, and I'm still learning something new every day about all of this stuff. Uh, he goes, and, and he goes, and it's, it's, it's difficult to know that I know nothing about my neighbor. It's, uh, it's difficult to know that. And the, the harder thing is, is like trying to, when you try to learn about it, um, 
it's not something that's easy to find out about. Like even when, when we go out and we were at the Onondaga Nations uh, arena, it wasn't like I drove through a uh, border crossing yep. or anything. If I didn't know that I was at that arena and like I had a, um, I don't know, like a certain respect to going to that arena just because I kind of knew what it was and I'm a bit of a lacrosse nerd, which is even funnier that the only reason I found out about all this is because I just happened to really enjoy the sport of lacrosse and I it blew my mind when I first started learning more and more about box lacrosse. And it's always blown my mind that your, your small nation can beat our ginormous like nations in box lacrosse. It just blows my mind that uh, with all the amount of uh, just the sheer population size, you think you figured we'd have enough athletes that it would be a different uh, series, but that's what I really like about box lacrosse that you really see the prettiness. It forces you to be a lacrosse player. You can't just be an athlete. Like you have to understand the game. It was similar to like, I grew up playing hockey where it's a, I don't know. There's a there's a feel to it. There's an anticipation. You really have to understand what's about to happen more than what's happening mm-hmm. in the sport. And like, there's a different level to you see you guys, and then to understand that okay, this is why they they play like that is because you know it's it's part of you. It's part of your culture, yeah. the history of it. It's really amazing to me the uh, the story. I find it's it's a beautiful story. I love it. I actually was talking to a kid about it the other day, very religious, like Christian guy. And when I said lacrosse was given to us by the creator, I was kind of like, ah, eh, what's he going to say about that? And he was just like, yeah, okay. That makes sense. Just, yeah. yeah. Went on with it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a, it, you know, it's a wonderful thing to have um, a gateway to have the conversation about something bigger right uh, because it you know through sport we're able to open a door to have other conversations about who people are and how they see themselves i know you know i have friends who are you know from australia and from scotland and from england and from all over the world right i have a lot of dutch friends you know there's you know my dutch assistant and his you know there's this huge movement now going on in his little art community uh, in Amsterdam, where they're painting two-row wampums all over the place, and they're designing, uh, incorporating the two-row wampum into designs, because they're like, hey, yeah, we were, you know, part of this terrible thing called uh, colonization. But there's this group of indigenous people that celebrate a relationship that we have with the two-row wampum, so we can acknowledge this terrible and acknowledge the good at the same time. And so the two-row wampum is popping up all over the place now in the Netherlands, right? You know, because, you know, the Dutch people want to be able to celebrate that. And they want to invite us in and they want to have that conversation, right? Uh, and, and the same thing doesn't happen here in our own country, in our own no. lands, um, which is unfortunate. And it happens at an individual level because someone is inspired by something that they're drawing. Ooh, I like bunk beds. Who, who invented bunk beds, you know? Um, you know, or uh, yeah, lacrosse, right? I love the sport. Where does it come from, right? Um, you know, so it becomes one of those gateways <clears throat> to initiate the conversation um, and opens the door for me to be able to have that conversation about things like the Canandaigua Treaty and about <clears throat> these uh, these uh, treaties, illegal state treaties, we'll call it, right? To to take away lands and take over lands that weren't actually necessarily uh <laughs> the right to have right so uh it's an interesting um it's an interesting conversation right and and even then the you know after the american revolution and the treaty of paris the lack of representation of indigenous people at that treaty right because that goes back to the doctrine of discovery you know that oh they these people don't need to be present they're they're like the deer and the birds they don't have souls. They don't have spirits. They don't matter. Right? Just yeah. us Just us in this room are, are the ones that matter. Those people, they're not people. They're savages. It's, yeah. a, it's a crazy way to, uh, to talk about humans, like in, in any, in any respect. And, and one thing that really actually, and it, 
it aggravates me, but I don't ever, I mean, it does aggravate me, but it doesn't, but we talk a lot in this country about what's happened to different cultures and different races and stuff. And, and it's, I always just find it so frustrating that like, you can't speak about what's happened to indigenous people, native Americans. And people are always kind of like, well, I don't even know what, you know, people want to be called. And it's like, well, do you know anybody from there? And that's really what mm-hmm. helps. Like when you know people from there, you're like, oh, they just want to be called Neil. They just want to be called Alex. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but I just, yeah. I've, at this point in my life to find it too. And you look back through the history and you find out like how many times the treaties have been broken and you look at, it's the same story over and over again with the United States government. They, they speak one way and they do something completely different. Like, you know, we're not going to acknowledge you guys. You can't come to the treaty uh, of Versailles or not Versailles, which you can't come to the French treaty yeah. in Paris. Yes. But we're going to make a treaty of Canandaigua with you. And then we're not really going to honor it. We kind of will. But then they also made sub deals. What I found really interesting was that any sale of land was supposed to go through the president. Or uh, I'm sorry, what is the word you guys use for? One of the guys. Yeah. Right. But the uh, any sale of any native land or reservation land or whatever term you want to use for um, the nation of the uh, Haudenosaunee was supposed to go through the president. And meanwhile, it was never signed off for the canal. It was never signed off for, and then they were immediately burning some villages. Yeah. It's very, uh, yeah. Yeah. Almost immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Uh, let's, let's have peace. You know, it's that it's the handshake and then the slap in the face right after. Right. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, even still today, you know, the last, at the last, uh, November 11th last year, you know, uh, we had our traditional leaders from our different nations present and we did a roll call of the American government officials that were there and there were none. Um, so once again, we're still showing up and the, you know, the, the representation isn't there on the other side. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is. Recently, uh, President Biden had stated uh, on, you know, uh, White House social media, on on White House stationery, right, had a a letter written about the Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. And one of the first sentences in that document he talks about honoring the treaties. Uh, and that is an interesting thing to say about honoring the treaties if we consider what that means for the United States and honoring the Canandaigua Treaty. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the original Canandaigua Treaty, I'm not very good at geography, but I can see, I think I'll be, yeah, I don't think my state's going to change, which I might, I'm probably moving over onto your side, but uh, yeah, it looks like most of the the whole middle section of the country's <clears throat> going back. I mean, that's supposedly why we're having, we're sending all the money to Ukraine right now is because we really care about this stuff. It's really yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know, uh, you know, we've had that. Uh, I've had that conversation in this city, right? Um, you know, there's there's this dialogues that go on about, you know, Onondaga Lake and 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 cleaning it up and you know all the pollution because it is a super site, you know. And then then there's the question, well, what does, you know, what does cleaning it up mean, right? And there's a lot of different perspectives. And the Haudenosaunee look at it as we need to be able to fish the fish the fish the, uh, to go in and eat the fish when we fish it. And we need to be able to swim and drink the water, right? That's restoring, right? That's the idea of restoration that generations to come will be able to enjoy this space the way it was intended. And uh, uh, right now, I think it's more at a, uh, you know, a Honeywell saying, good enough. We'll get to, to a certain level of PCB and a certain level of this and that, and good enough. Well, cap it, right? Um, but it's not good enough, right? It's not. And and the, you know, what does that mean if I burn down your house and then I build a portion of one room back up and say good enough? 
<laughs> you know, you're not actually restoring my house that you just burned down. You just built, you know, part of one room and said, okay, you're, you're good. It's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's the same story over and over again. So right, I live right by one of those super fun sites. Uh, G uh, had a factory with all the coolant PCBs. I'm, I live basically just north of where the river is polluted there the factory where it all come out when i bring my kids over to my parents when they i actually grew up on the other side of the river so i've always grown up by it and to find like i thought it was a unique rare thing oh my god this company did this one thing here and same thing it all goes back to treaties and contracts and, and the laws if you pollute something you're responsible for fixing it and they're doing the same thing here they like dredged it all and they were like, no, we've replanted stuff. It's good. Trust us. We know what we're doing now. Yeah. 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 Oh. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And, and there, it's always the, the loophole to find the loophole. Right. So, so the question then becomes what, what does making it right mean? Right. Um, how do you, how do you know, if the president's saying it, companies are saying it, right. People are saying it, right? Whoever whoever that person is that says it, right? And they want to make it right. What does that mean to make it right? What does it mean to make someone whole? Right? What does it mean to make the river whole? Right? Um, uh, there's a, a graduate student here that, that um, at SUNY ESF, right? And it's kind of connected to Syracuse University. And, and they were doing their research on waterways, rivers. And within all of their documentation and their scientific research, they used a word for the waterways. They named, they had, they used the actual names like George, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like they, 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 and they spoke about the river and the waterways that they were researching about as if it was a person, a living being with a spirit, because that's the way we see the world, right? And so he was simply acknowledging his understanding of the world and our relationship with the water, with Mother Earth, with our elder brother, the sun, the grandmother, moon, however you want to say it, right? Whatever that that area that that indigenous group in that area refers to them as, that's what he was doing, and it was really powerful for me to see that young person doing scientific research and speaking about the waterways that they were researching with with a name, right? And then just this summer, I was in uh, in uh, visiting a friend of my wife's in Massachusetts. And we start talking or driving around and on the way down, I don't know why we start talking about swampy areas. And I don't know if we were talking about Lord of the Rings or what, I don't remember what it was. And I was like, why is a bog called a bog? Like, where does that word come from? Right. So we're driving down. And so then we're talking to our, 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 our friend and she's driving us around the, you know, Boston area. And she starts talking about the indigenous people, the area, the names. And she goes, yeah. She goes, if you if you come across the name of a pe group of people and it ends in bog or cog or something of that nature, OG, then it refers to still sitting water, to still water. And I was like, oh my gosh, she just answered my question, my random question on the way down, right? And then she goes, if the name of the community ends in P-E-E, -E, right, P or something of that, you know, there's slight variations of that, that's actually um, how they, they would say moving water. So Mashpee, they were the people of a particular moving water, right? And so you, so you can start to look at the names of that geographical area of those people and see where they were living, whether it was by moving water or by a more still, still, stilled water, right? Or still space water or a lake or a swampy area. And she says, and if it if the name of the community ends in ETS, E-E-T-T-S, then it refers to the forest. 
How many people in the state of Massachusetts know that? <laughs> I bet not many. I bet not many. Exactly. Unless there was someone that talked to an indigenous person who explained the, the language breakdown at the back of the name. Yeah. Right. The only uh the only reason I knew anything about like our area is I happened to where I grew up. There's a guy who lived uh two or three houses down from me, but he had a teepee in his backyard always. Mr. Mosier was his name, but every parade, every every event that was ever held in that town, he always put on his traditional uh clothing. And he would go walk the parade and talk to all the kids. And he he was big on it because so where I actually grew up is probably about, a, I don't know, half a mile away from where the uh, the supposed last of the Mohican story was written. Okay. So he was really big on like, no, this was, yeah, this was, our, you know, this was a much different area. This was not. And yeah. it was cool. And most people don't get that experience i don't even remember much of it other than he just really explained like they're you know basically don't believe all the stuff you're reading he's like there was there was wars through here throughout time he's like you know i uh i want to say he was a mohican and he's like we were you know we were fighting sometimes we had control of this area sometimes we'd be here and yeah it was very most people don't get that though yeah yeah Unless sure. you just ha happen to uh, have a guy who happens to move to a town for whatever reason and still holds on to it and is willing to take the time to uh, spread it because that's really yeah. the only only way this all happens. Yeah, the time and the effort to do it. Yeah. That's huge. Uh, yeah. well, I won't take up too much of your time. I know you're busy. Um, one of these days we got to uh, get together. Congratulations. I hear you're the Binghamton coach. I am. Yeah, the Binghamton Bombers. How does. Uh, that's got to feel pretty good to be a part of this because my understanding is there's a lot of um, native players who are going to get a chance to get paid now, essentially, and they're trying to get local teams and to have that many teams based right around where all the um, where all the natives are. I mean, that's really got to be awesome for for so many people in the area. Yeah, yeah, no, it's exciting. You know, there's a few native coaches. In the league, uh, uh, my cousin is actually coaching another one of the teams as an assistant, and um, and an old friend of mine is coaching another team, uh, the Syracuse team, right? So, and then the irony is, is even though my cousin coaches for another team, I drafted his younger brother uh, before he did, right? So, so you know, you have this interesting kind of, um, you know uh opportunity right for for different players and people to be able to play and and you know i you know i scoured through the through the list of players and recruited players and got them to sign up and you know i was fortunate enough to get a, a former nll goalie in uh um, jacob lazor you know played for the philadelphia wings and and ty thompson you know one of the the thompson trio from albany and you know, played for the New Jersey Storm and all that. You know, he's he was uh, you know wasn't in the NLL in the moment and took took the opportunity. Of other former NLL players, Ryan Hoteling and Donnie Moss and uh, you know uh, Leland Paulus, right? He played uh, professional NLL for a couple of years. And um, Matthew Bennett, you know, former uh, Salt City Eel. Right. He certainly has the skills, two time All American, you know, to, yeah. to be playing at that level. Um, but we also picked up a couple uh Utica Yeti guys to give him a tryout, you know. So there might be some some Utica guys and some other guys that are on the Yeti from other towns that, that might get an opportunity if they uh if they are able to apply some of the things that they've learned over the last couple of years playing for the Yeti to uh to see if they can do it at at an elevated level and i also picked up one of my players from the um the dutch national team as well that's awesome so you yeah that's really cool to hear and i love to hear like you said that uh you've got a couple of the yetis and the guys are going all over the place that's i've been trying to talk to all those guys uh leota <clears throat> excuse me uh whatever team gets him that kid is a lightning bolt i tell you he's see a lot of potential in that kid the uh yeah it's just it's 
been a crazy ride for me to uh, get to know all of you guys and then to watch this blow up at the mm -hmm. same time. So mm -hmm. super fortunate. And uh, yeah, hopefully one of these days when I get a little bit more time, and if you do, I'd like to, uh, we'll talk because I hear you've got big plans for going into Binghamton as far as trying to uh, set up some things. Yeah, we are, you know, the, the, the arena holds 4,700, you know, and we're hoping to, to blow the roof off the place, you know, so we're trying to connect uh, locally and regionally, you know, I know that the Utica's, you know, you know, 45 minutes from Syracuse and Syracuse has a franchise, you know, but we also, you know, at the Binghamton space, um, we have some players from Binghamton that play for the Yeti, you know, and they drove up to Utica all the time to practice and play. And, you know, hopefully the, the Yeti faithful come down to Binghamton and check out some of the guys that, that they've been cheering for the Yeti uh, in the professional level and, you know, bring uh, that, that um, brand of excitement. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, I've talked to Necker and uh, he's already pretty excited about going down and, and checking things out, you know, and hopefully, uh, you know, I'll say this, I'll say this, I'm doing my best to recruit the best players I can. Uh, we got some PLL players. We got some NLL players. You know, we we do have a, a variety of native players sprinkled in there. You know, so just know this: if that if a Utica Yeti player makes the roster, uh, he had to run through the gauntlet to earn it. And yeah, he should that player, whoever it ends up being, should be celebrated and commended for that effort. For sure. Yeah, I talked to uh, I talked to Brian earlier. He yeah. He's great, great guy. I tell you, he is one funny, funny, funny young man. But oh my God, watching him, he's amazing. Um, one thing I wanted to say to you though, if you guys want, like, uh, once you get your team and everybody's in, I'll do like a little meet the players thing, and I'll set up a little thing so that way you guys can load it on your YouTube or whatever. I don't mind. I'm just trying sure. to teach myself and get as much of this as I can. So, yeah, absolutely. No, we'd be happy to do that. And you know, we're um, trying to create a pretty good um, social media presence. Online. Yeah. Well, it's, I talked to a couple of the, uh, um, I already got uh, Jimmy Fay and I did Gonzola's episode. So mm -hmm. those are good. But uh, do you happen to know that Marshall Paulus that I'm talking to? He played, I think he's playing for Saskatchewan Rush, which I just found out when I started researching him. Yeah. I found him because when we streamed Lax and I, I was, uh, I'm clipping through the highlights and I just kept seeing this number 39 and I was like, wow, he is, he's, he doesn't always score, but his real, I guess, brilliance is he moves the ball in a way that just blows everybody's mind. Yeah. At least me when I watch him. Oh yeah. 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 No, he's, he's not related. So there's a, it's an interesting thing. There's, um, there's a Paulus family out here, but you know, there's some, a few Oneidas and, and. You know, there's an Oneida community that has a bunch of Pauluses in Canada. And then there's the Onondaga Pauluses, which is my line. Um, and we have a lot of, <laughs> uh, oddly enough, small small family line, but a lot of professional lacrosse players. Uh, my grandfather played professional in the 30s. My brother Barry played professional and then coached in the NLL. I played in the NLL. Um, Leland Paulus played in the NLL. His older brother, Jeffrey Paulus, played in the NL, you know, um, you know, and then uh, there are my cousin, you know, um, also, you know, you know, probably could have played in the NLL, but, you know, age wise and everything else didn't get the opportunity to do it. Um, and so you had this really, you know, interesting level of lacrosse that comes out of the Paulus family in Onondaga. And then the level of lacrosse that comes out of the Six Nation Paulus family of Gaylord Paulus, you know, and you have Delby Paulus, former all pro in the NLL, Marshall Paulus is part of that line, you know, and so you have a whole nother set of Pauluses that are from Six Nations and we're not related. And then there's another set of Pauluses from Oneida, Oneida, Ontario, and they're not related, but we're all playing at a professional level. And so it's a name you end up seeing in the professional ranks like Paulus, Paulus, Paulus. There's Nelson Paulus, right? Nelson Paulus is a world-class bicycle, uh, uh, bike, bicycle, yeah. you know, and he's, he's competing with the, you know, he had the, the, the gold, the yellow Jersey in the Tour de France <laughs> two years ago, 
he's not related to us. You know, he's he's a Wisconsin Paulus. Yeah. Right, he's from Oneida, Wisconsin. He's not even from the same geographical region, right? Probably, you know, generationally, there's probably that connection to the London, Ontario policies, but no relation to my policy line, right? But yet, here he is, world-renowned athlete, right? Um, and it's funny, um, I had a, a two, one player and my assistant coach uh, were in Paris. Um, uh, the, the assistant coach, he's a videographer, he got hired by one of my players who works in sports and sports promotions. So they're at the Tour de France. And so they're shooting video and they're, you know, they're, they're talking and joking and laughing. And obviously they know me as their head coach. And, and I don't know which one of them said it. And they go, who is that guy? Neil's son, Paulus? <laughs> <laughs> and they laugh. So the whole time they're there shooting the video, they're like, oh, there goes Neil's son, Paulus. Right? Um, instead of Nielsen, Paulus. Right? So it was pretty funny. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just it's pretty pretty amazing that uh, you know pockets of this name um, end up showing up in really profound ways at uh, amazing levels of athletic feats. Um, um, yeah, so that reason, I guess you know I, I I made a comment and I don't know you know uh, how socially uh, <laughs> um, you know aware. You, there, there's uh, these dialogues and conversations and things that people might say here and there. Um, <clears throat> and I have to ask myself the question. I don't know what the, the answer is, right? But, you know, as the, as the father of two chemists, right, uh, chemistry majors in college and, and having done my fair share of science in college myself, I have to ask the question of genetics of of most indigenous people, um, because in some way we are the children of survivors of genocide. And what does that mean? What things did we have to go through? What things did our ancestors have to go through to survive? What skills and, and skill sets at that time, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, came in handy for them to survive when they were escaping uh, wars, when they were running from boarding schools, when they were uh, surviving starvation, right? Uh, and so there's an inherent genetic drive. Um, and, and, you know, so part of me has to ask myself, you know, as far as last names go, is there something there? I don't know. I don't know, but I, but I do know that my drive personally uh, is, you know, just something that I have really uh, tried to work hard to hone um, because I, I understood that in order to be successful in anything, you got to show up first, right? And then if you show up, you might as well do your best. And if you're going to do your best, then the best way to do your best is to be open to learn and to be coachable. And then the fourth piece that I add in to this as a coach is to have fun. Because that's truly how we, how we thrive in that space. Uh, we can't be uh, really pushing ourselves to the absolute limit it's very seriously 24-7. Uh, it's too much. Stress is too much. We have to have fun and enjoy it at some point. Um, and so, you know, usually that's my number one rule of lacrosse when I coach is have fun, then show up, do your best, be coachable. If you do those four things, uh, we're going to have fun together and uh, we're going to play hard. We're going to play tough. We're going to hit you hard. Uh, we're going to shoot a lot. We're going to score a lot. We're going to play tough D. We're going to stop you. You're going to have to work hard to beat us. Um, and we're going to have fun doing it uh, because we're going to enjoy ourselves. Um, through the whole process, right? The, the, the lesson learned is the process more so than the destination, right? That's what really makes us great, uh, is enjoying the process. And so I, you know, that's something that I really hone in on every team I coach, enjoy the process. Because if you're too focused on where we end up at the end, you're not gonna appreciate wherever it is you end up. 
the uh... enjoy the process, right? If you enjoy the process of learning, if you enjoy the process of listening to this podcast, if you enjoy the process of learning more about your world, your world and what's around you, right? You're going to enjoy the world more because yeah. you're, you're going to, your life will be more full of different things that will allow you more opportunities to enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, it's uh no, that sums it up right there. I mean, look at, I'm talking to you about the Canandaigua treaty when two years ago, I would have had no idea what any of it was. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's showing up and joining the journey. Like I said, I was talking to a, a guy the other day and he said, it's really important that you shoot 50 sets of 50 and 50 and 50. And I was like, it is, but, when I was a kid, we happened to have a buck, a uh, bucket or a bucket that held 50 bucks. We went out there and we shot four or five buckets a day, but it wasn't because we thought of it as work. Like you said, you have to enjoy it. If it's fun, what you're doing. Yeah. We had amazing stick skills. Like I could still pick up a hockey stick and probably I haven't touched one in years and do most of what I do and like skate. Like you said, you learn it, but if, if you don't enjoy the process, if you're not having fun, then you're not really trying as hard as you can. And yeah, it's a different. Yeah. 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 And, and that's my goal, right? My goal as a, as a coach of this team is to create and develop a process that guys will enjoy competing, right? Pushing each other to the absolute limit, right? To, to see how good we can be, right? Because we're, we're not going to know how good we can be unless we push ourselves. And we have to push ourselves every practice. We have to push our, each other to the limit to find out what each other's limit is. And, you know, we'll find out what guys belong and what the, who doesn't, right? Um, so we're taking, uh, you know, we're, we're probably going to go as, as we're going to try to get as close as we can as to the, to the 30, uh, the, the players that we can take to try out for the, for the training camp. And we're going to have to make some cuts. And we might be cutting some really good players. And that's okay. That's okay. Because at the end of the day, if we're that good that we're cutting players and other players, teams are going to pick up. Good luck trying to keep up with the guys that I keep. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... You know what I mean? And that's exciting. I was just talking to my assistant coaches. We're looking at our roster that we have and the guys that are signed contracts and the guys that we're talking to. And we're like, man, we are going to have some fun. That's... We're going to have a fun team to watch and uh, we're going to have fun doing it too. That's awesome. And I think the PBLA is nailing it with the uh, small market idea. Cause like our thunder team, our local hockey team, my kids aren't into sports. So I don't, we don't go very often, but every time I go to the game, you see, they have like the kids, the local kids that play hockey are so dedicated that even the kids that aren't, they're just dedicated to that team. If you, if you can get that small town feel where the whole town backs you. Yeah. I think you, uh, yeah. I'm really hoping it's successful for you guys. And uh, I think yeah. it definitely and, sounds like you got the right attitude for it. Yeah. And fans like to watch a, watch a win, right. And you win and you, you, you know, you beat, beat, uh, you beat a team on the scoreboard and, you know, and you, you hit them hard and you play tough and play tough where you need to. Right. Uh, there, there's some spaces there where you can, you can go and, and the league is, is looking at the rules and the brand of lacrosse where, you know, we might have a few fights here and there, like a hockey game, right? So you're going to get that physicality. Um, but instead of a hockey game having three goals or four goals, if it, if it's a big night, you know, we might get 15 to 20. You know, so you got 20 chances to cheer, 15 chances to cheer for your team, hopefully. You know, um, and our goal would be to keep our opponents below 10. Yeah. I think if uh, I think once people get in there to see it, I I know just some of the the top talented guys I've seen that play that are making these rosters. Uh, that Matt Johnson I just talked to, he's playing for the Chowderheads. Him with the stick, it's it's different. You can see the guys that really have that feel and they're they're scoring goals. And I mean, you're easily you're still talking the top, you know, four hundred people in the country. You get yeah. fans in there to see it once they're going to be, they're going to be hooked. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. For sure. You know, and, and most of these guys that I'm picking up, like I said, if they haven't played in the NLL, they belong in the NLL or, or they're on the edge of, right. Um, and, uh, and that's the whole point. Right. And so, you know, uh, 
I, I don't worry as much about other teams and what they're going to do. I just got to worry about my guys and what I got and do the best with what we have and and see where we go from there. But uh, I'm pretty excited to see what we got and what we'll do. That's awesome. I can't wait. I'll be, uh, it's a bit of a drive for me, but I'll definitely make it out there for, for one or two games. That'd be great. Uh, and uh, we'll see how we can hook you up with uh, some some screen time with the guys. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm probably not going to edit this one or add anything to it. I'm just going to send it out tomorrow as like my uh, candidate yeah. with Veterans Day. Uh, I only have, you know, a couple hundred guys that follow, but if we teach one or two kids, that's one sure. or two kids. Sounds good. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll talk to you. Yeah. Have a good night. You too. Yeah. Bye.